brought to you by the REL Pacific at McCrell International. Here is our agenda for today, and I'm saying welcome. My name is Robin Wisniewski from, uh, from the REL, and we have uh, Dr. Herbert Henneman, who is a strategic management, um, he's the professor emeritus at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and he is with us today sharing human resource alignment, assessing human resource alignment, readiness for human resource alignment, and then at the end, we will have questions and answers. During our webinar, you may submit any questions you have in the chat box. And you see the chat box on your control panel. And at the end, during the Q&A, we will uh, use those questions. Uh, and then we'll have concluding remarks and a survey at the end. Here are today's goals, so I'll introduce to you our goals for today as well as what REL Pacific is and what we do. So for today's goals, we have to understand why it's important to align human resource policies and learn a process for aligning them, to, and also to understand how aligning human resource policies can support systems efforts to improve teacher effectiveness. And to share some of what we do at REL Pacific, these are the entities that are served by REL Pacific. And REL Pacific is at McCrell. It's one of 10 regional educational laboratories funded by the Institute of Education Sciences. It serves educators in American Samoa, the Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands, the Federated States of Micronesia, Guam, Hawaii, the Republic of the Marshall Islands, and the Republic of Palau. So we see these in our image here. And this is about REL Pacific and who we serve. And the REL Pacific work. What we do is identify priority needs in the region through comprehensive reviews of education system data, interviews and educate with education agency staff, and ongoing contact with the field and support research alliances that bring together key stakeholders to work collaboratively to address problems and questions of high priority and relevance to education in the Pacific. So here are the REL Pacific priority areas and what we focus on, which are teacher effectiveness, which is what we're focused on today for the webinar, family and community engagement, college and career readiness, and optimizing data systems. We're located at the Pacific Center for Changing the Odds in Honolulu, Hawaii. And McCrell is a private nonprofit corporation that draws upon the best of education research to translate what works into innovations and results. So today's presenter is Dr. Herbert Henneman. And he's an emeritus in business, senior researcher at the Wisconsin Center for Education Research at the University of Wisconsin, Madison. Uh, Dr. Henneman, you can, uh, can you hear okay? I can. Okay. Well, here's today's focus, and you could take it from here. Okay, thank you, and welcome everyone to the webinar. It's a pleasure to be talking with you about issues regarding human capital management and the alignment of human capital management systems. Um, you will see throughout the webinar that I will use synonymously the terms human resources and human capital. Um, you will also, uh, I think, uh, probably understand that the term human capital is of, of a bit more recent usage. But as I said, I'll treat those two uh, simultaneously or uh, synonymously. I'll start out talking a little bit about the strategic management of human resources to set the stage for what we will then be leading up to, which is um, an introduction to the concept of human resource alignment, and then shifting to talking about a process for actually assessing human resource alignment in a school district, 
and then concluding by talking a little bit about uh, judging a district's readiness for human resource alignment. And so with that by way of introduction, um, let us move on. Okay, what is strategic human capital management? This has been a, a question that people have been working on for a long time. Um, but I think the use of the term strategic here uh, has special importance to us. Um, the first thing that we note when we start talking about strategic is that human capital management uh, practices uh, focus on performance improvement. And so everything that we'll be talking about today is going to be looking at human capital management from the standpoint of improving performance of educators. And we'll be talking in particular about teachers as our educator group that we will be focusing on. Many times organizations talk about other ways of improving human capital management. They might talk about things such as cost reduction. They might talk about things such as administrative process efficiency. Or they might talk about the timeliness of human capital management actions. All of those are important ways of thinking about uh, human capital management and how effective it is. But our focus is going to be on alignment to performance improvement um, as, as we go through the webinar today. The second thing that we're going to emphasize is that human capital management practices need to work together as a system, as opposed to um, working as individual standalone um, sorts of practices. And we will see, for example, that performance of pay is an example in which if we try to use performance pay as a standalone system, it's likely to not work. And the reason for that is that it's not linked to other aspects of human capital management, uh, such areas as professional development and mentoring for teachers. Uh, those kinds of systems will be in place, hopefully, to help teachers improve their performance and therefore be able to qualify for the compensation rewards promised by the performance pay system. But a performance pay system alone without those kinds of linkages is unlikely to be successful. We're also going to emphasize that performance measurement should guide human capital management decisions and human capital management programs. Uh, that will be a very recurring theme. And finally, we are going to emphasize that human capital management strategically is not just what human resource departments in a typical district uh, do. We are going to suggest instead that Human capital management also resides within the instructional side of the street in a district. It exists at the school level as well. And uh, we are also going to be talking about uh, possibly the principal as a human capital manager, uh, him or, her or herself at the school level. So that is sort of a, a, a introduction to what we think about when we think about strategic human capital management, let's move forward. In the next slide here, we look at the generic way of thinking about the performance impact of human resource management practices. We see that we have human resource management practices with several focuses. They are there to acquire, develop, motivate, and retain individuals who have specific performance competencies. Those performance competencies are ones desired by the district, which the district thinks will allow them to achieve district goals and strategies, particularly as those goals and strategies relate to instruction and learning. We can illustrate this uh, more uh, closely as follows. In this particular slide here, if you start at the upper left-hand uh, part of the slide, you'll see, for example, a district might have a goal of improved student achievement. And derived from that goal might be certain strategies for in reaching that goal. And then based on those strategies, the district asks itself, what competencies do people have 
need to have in order to help us implement this strategy? What do people in key roles actually have to know and be able to do to help us develop and implement the strategies? Once those competencies have been identified, then more specific strategies for acquisition, development, retention, and motivation can unfold in the district through their strategic planning process. Ultimately, that's going to lead to a set of human capital management programs uh, shown in the upper right-hand corner. We will be talking about all of those human capital management programs as we go forward. And then the key link is that usage of those human capital management programs will lead back to the goal of improved student achievement. Now as we move ahead, we can use the term performance competencies and we need to be very clear about what we mean by performance competencies because that's a very key term in our uh, discussion of strategic human capital management. We see that competencies can in a sense be thought of as leverage points for the district. They are the leverage point for the impact of human resource management practices on organizational performance. That was illustrated in the previous slide and is worth reiterating. So what exactly is a competency? Well, a competency is simply a statement of knowledge, ability, or behavior that contributes to the effectiveness of performance in one's role. Examples for teachers of competencies would be such things as knowing one's students, establishing a classroom culture for learning, using discussion techniques that engage in students, and something such as communicates with families. To the next slide, we can also think about teacher, individual teacher competencies as being formed into what's called a teacher competency model, where we have sets of desired performance competencies, competencies and those are typically in, in, embedded in some kind of a teacher evaluation system with rubrics. Perhaps one of the most well-known examples is the framework for teaching that was developed by Charlotte Danielson. In the framework for teaching, we have four what she calls domains of teacher performance competencies. Those domains are planning and preparation, the classroom environment, instruction, and professional responsibilities. And then within each of those domains, uh, Charlotte has gone on to identify more specific competencies in the form of what she calls components and elements. And those are accompanied by which illustrate levels of effectiveness with regard to those uh, performance competencies. Also, there are a number of different state models that have been developed. And also, there have been customized models that have been developed. But all of these models, in one way or another, attempt to sort of map out a, um, a way of thinking about performance competencies for being successful as a teacher. Now, with this by way of background, let's uh, move on to our second topic, which is going to be an introduction to the concept of human resource alignment. What you see before you is what we call the human resource alignment wheel. This wheel is designed to graphically illustrate what we call a coherent and comprehensive human capital management system. What I'd like to do is start at the hub or axle of the wheel with performance competencies. These are exactly the performance competencies that we just described and they represent the focal point of the human capital management system. We can see that the performance competencies are surrounded by performance assessment, and this basically represents the teacher or principal evaluation system that is in use or could be developed to assess those performance competencies. We then see that leading out of the performance competencies and performance assessment uh, hubs, 
are the human resource practice areas themselves. You can see that those are defined as recruitment, selection, induction, mentoring, professional development, and compensation. These practices represent like the spokes of the human resource wheel and um, are looking back into the performance hub as we have defined it. It's important for us to recognize that the human resource alignment wheel depicts a very general view of human resource alignment. By that I mean it depicts human resource capital management wherever it might be practiced. That could be at the central office uh, in the human resource department, it could be at the school level, or it could be in another administrative unit of the district. Also the wheel depicts uh, in a very generic way that these practices might be conducted by any number of different individuals. These could be central uh, HR staff, they could be central instructional staff within the district, they could be other instructional leaders such as mentors or master teachers. Let me say a little bit more about uh, the Human Resource Alignment Wheel and its uh, relevance to our discussion. First of all, we mentioned that the, the wheel depicts coherence. And by coherence, we mean that all of the human resource practice areas are focused on the performance competencies and wanting to um, acquire, develop, motivate, and retain those competencies. Secondly, the wheel depicts a comprehensive HR system. It's brought across all of the HR practice areas. Uh, third, it, it shows that performance assessment or educator evaluation uh, results are going to inform all HR practice areas. And I suggested it indicates that compensation practices, while an inter integral part of human capital management systems, cannot be thought of as standalone systems. As I've indicated previously, this particularly pertains to um, um, performance pay. And finally, the wheel indicates what is called vertical alignment, which represents the alignment of human capital practices to the competencies, as well as horizontal alignment, which represents the linkages between the HR practices. By vertical alignment, we mean the degree to which the content of an HR practice focuses on, embeds, and communicates the desired performance competencies. You can see there are a couple of examples of what might be vertical alignment. For example, does the teacher evaluation system measure the desired competencies of the district? Or as a very different example, is the degree to which job applicants possess the competencies desired actually assessed during the selection and hiring process? In terms of uh, horizontal alignment, this is the degree to which the human resource management practices are mutually supportive and reinforcing each of each other. And there are a couple of examples shown. For example, do the results of the educator evaluation system get used to identify particular performance, or excuse me, professional development needs of educators? Or as a very different example, drawing on performance pay are the ratings from the evaluation system used in actually making pay increase decisions of evaluators. Okay, now let's turn to a more uh, broad discussion of vertical alignment because that's where we're going to be focusing the rest of our attention. What you see on the slide here is a illustration of how vertical alignment can be thought of in terms of a variety of human capital management practices and decisions. On the left hand side we've taken the seven human capital management practice areas and then broken them out into sub areas as well. And then um, for each of those sub areas we show examples of a specific human, human capital management practice and how that practice might 
lead to a or be used in a particular human capital management decision. So the, the practices themselves that we de we're depicting are not unique uh, by way of sort of their generic nature. What is unique this is that the practices are competency focused. And if you read the descriptions of these human capital management practices, you will see that this idea of competency focus being reflected in those descriptions. For example, in the area of recruitment, the, the first um, area depicted are, is the organization, is the district use sourcing applicants who have the competencies. For example, are they going to teacher education programs that instill the kinds of competencies that the district desires? Or as another example, in terms of communicating with applicants, is the district informing applicants about the competencies that are being um, desired by the district? Or uh, going down to induction, for example, pre-service, are new hires being introduced to the education system, which is based on the performance co competencies? And are they receiving training in the evaluation system itself so that they can learn more about how they will be evaluated on the competencies as well as how they will be helped improve on the competencies? So we have these human, cap and ma human capital management practices, and those practices, in turn, can be used to guide a series of competency-focused sorts of decisions. Now what I'd like to do is turn toward, oh, excuse me, this is another slide illustrating additional human capital practice management areas, including performance management and compensation, to round out the areas of human capital management practice for which alignment uh, could be best. Let's turn now to an exploration of how a district might actually go about assessing the degree of alignment of all of those human capital management practices with the performance competencies. That would represent assessing what we call vertical alignment assessment of, human, of the human capital management system. The district needs to engage in this assessment process to really learn more about its current human capital management system and how aligned it is to the performance competencies and then use that as a basis for developing a comprehensive, what we call performance competency-focused human capital management. This assessment process is going to be a process for determining the degree to which the human resource management practices and decisions are aligned with the performance competencies, and then based on that information, developing recommendations for improvement in each of the human capital management practices. What I'm going to do now is have us focus on assessment of vertical alignment of human resource management practices for teachers. What I'd like to describe here is a HR human resource alignment assessment process that a, a colleague of mine, Tony Milianowski, and I developed. Tony is currently a, a researcher at Westat Corporation, and at the time we conducted this study, he was a colleague of the University of Wisconsin. Our study was conducted in uh, a midwestern, excuse me, a southwestern uh, LEA of about 60,000 students that were willing to have us uh, pilot test this particular assessment process. And the process involved four, four major steps that I would like to uh, discuss with you in a little bit of detail. Once the district understood what we were going to do, namely look at how human capital management practices link to the performance competencies in the district, uh, we undertook four major steps. 
the first thing that we did was was form a small work group of people who would be conducting the study. The work group was composed of three people from the Human Resource Department, including the Human Resource Director, and three people from the instructional um, side of the district, including, for example, the Director of Mentoring. And also it included the person who was the president of the Teachers Association. Once we had the group formed, then we began preparing the group for the um, actual conduct of the assessment. We reviewed with them the competency model upon which the teacher evaluation system was based. And that teacher evaluation system was based on the framework for teaching, which I described briefly uh, previously. We then uh, provided to the group an explanation and discussion of the human resource alignment practice, or excuse me, process that they would actually be using as we went forward. We also indicated that the focus was going to be on human resource practices at the district level as opposed to the level. Those human resource district practices uh, some of those were housed within the Human Resource Department. In particular, um, the practices pertaining to recruitment, selection, evalu teacher evaluation, and compensation were responsibilities of the Human Resource Department. Within the uh, instructional uh, side of the district were housed human resource practices pertaining to induction, mentoring, and professional development. So you can see that we had an eclectic group of individuals here representing uh, both the human resource and instructional sides of the district, as well as the individual representing the teachers themselves via the teacher association. The final thing that we did by way of preparation was to uh, come up with meeting schedules that everybody could meet and we decided to meet in two-hour blocks very early in the morning um, so everyone would have a chance to participate. The next thing that we did was develop descriptions of human resource or human capital management practices. We actually sat down and wrote out descriptions of these practices as a way of informing everybody of what those practices were as a review. And also, we emphasized in those practices the extent to which there were, uh, were areas where there was an actual focus on the performance competencies themselves in the practice. So we are trying to describe the extent to which the competencies were embedded in the practices themselves. Once we had the descriptions prepared, then each of the people in the, in the work group would be a short description of a practice area and a sub area. Uh, for example, um, like in the, uh, in the uh, recruitment area, they would be shown a description of the sources that were used by the district, as well as ways that the district communicated um, with job applicants. The individuals would read those descriptions and then they would use a one to four rating scale to rate the degree to which the particular practice they were reading about actually incorporated the competencies from the competency model. The individuals worked independently uh, by reading these descriptions and then providing an independent rating. After the ratings were done, we would have a discussion of their ratings and then they were allowed to re-rate to come up with a final rating. Process was followed for each of the human capital management practice areas. And then at the conclusion, we had a separate session in which the uh, group came together as a whole and we brainstormed ideas on how to improve human capital alignment in each of the human practice areas. This whole process um, took several days spread out over those two hour time blocks that I mentioned um, as a way of illustrating the intensity with which we were engaged in the human resource alignment assessment process. 
what kinds of um, results did we achieve? One thing that we found is that when we looked at the average ratings that were given to the resource practice areas in terms of their degree of alignment to the performance competencies, we found wide differences in the amount of alignment that was present. We find the highest degree of alignment for induction and performance management activities, and we found the lowest degree of alignment for uh, compensation and recruitment activities. So there was, there was a varying degree of alignment overall in the human capital management system to the performance competencies. We also uncovered from the group 34 separate suggestions for how alignment could be improved across the performance practices. And I will uh, show you some examples of those particular alignment improvement suggestions in just a moment. The other thing that I would mention to you is that a written report was prepared um, by this study group, the work group, and that report was then formally presented to the board of the district, and the board accepted uh, the report from the work group. Another set of results that um, I don't show on the screen, but I would like to briefly mention, is that the work group itself um, reported to us some very important indications of what they learned during doing the assessment process. First thing they indicated was they found it a very eye-opening experience. It was something they had never done before or ever thought before, thought of before, in terms of human capital management practices and, and focusing on performance competencies. They thought it was basically a nifty experience. And they said it also helped them truly grasp what the HR practices were in the district. Most of them were familiar with some, but not all of the practices. And this really allowed them to see the full range of practices that were engaged in by the district. They also reported to us that they found the assessment of vertical alignment to be a very straightforward process and a very helpful process for understanding how potentially effective each of the human resource practices was by the district. And finally, they, they said that it really helped them understand that the human resources is not just an HR office function, but they, they really felt that it, HR crosses over to the instruction side of the district as well. And they also thought that by doing this process, it would help the district uh, in the future break down some silos that existed between resources and instruction as a way of improving interactions between the human resource practice areas throughout the district. So the, the group basically reported some very positive reactions to being a participant in the, um, the study process. Now let me turn to some specific examples of what came out of the study. Examples that we um, arrived at were classified into one of three categories. The first category was, let's do this now. This is something that is relatively simple and inexpensive. We could do it. Let's do it. The second was, this is something that actually really makes sense, but we need to, we need to take some time to do it. Let's do it within a year and set that as our goal. Or then finally, there were a couple of suggestions where the work group said, this is such a complex topic that we need to basically study it further um, before any final record recommendation could be made with regard to a particular practice. So turning first of all to the let's do it now um, decision, one thing that, that was very clear uh, to the work group is that the district was not communicating the performance competency model to job applicants. And so that applicants were simply unaware of what the district was looking for in terms of competencies. And the solution to that was very simple. 
let's put the competency model directly on the website where applicants uh, can see it at the time they look at us as a district or actually become applicants to us as a district. In the one year area, the first thing that the, the work group suggested was a need for a competency focused interview for teacher candidates. They had examined examples of the kinds of interviews that were being conducted at both the district and the school level. And they basically found that those um, interviews were not really competency focused, uh, nor were they necessarily standardized uh, from candidate to candidate. So they thought that we, what was really needed was a standardized process for assessing competencies by developing competency focused interview questions. Those questions could ask candidates, for example, um, for them to provide a description of a particular competency practice that they engaged in um, in their teaching, or it could ask them to provide an example of um, how they would handle a particularly competency-focused uh, situation if they were presented with it. Another thing that uh, the work group indicated needed to be done was that there was a need to look at all of the professional development and in-service uh, activity that was being provided in the district and to evaluate each of those actions and see to what extent they were in fact competency focused. So this suggested therefore that um, there should be a whole scale review of of all professional development activity and the degree to which it was competency focused. And implicit in this was the suggestion that certain activities, if they were not competency focused, would either need to be changed or simply eliminated uh, from the district. And then finally, in terms of doing within, there was a, they felt a need for teachers to receive more feedback based on teacher evaluations. This feedback could be of both a written and an oral nature, and this was something that would have to be worked on with the principals in more detail over the year to help them become better providers of written and oral feedback. Finally, there was a need to study further lengthening a probationary period from a very short one year to two years, and then uh, secondly, to change what counts for lane movement on the single salary schedule. Here in particular, they were thinking about the idea of not counting uh, many current professional development activities as actually being competency focused and thus uh, counting for um, movement on the lane schedule. So you can see that the, the work group came up with a wide variety of different potential improvements that could be made in the human capital management system to make it more competency focused and therefore more vertically aligned. With that as an illustration, let me turn to saying a little bit about if you were a district, excuse me, um, I should also indicate that um, the human resource capital management alignment exercise could also be extended to the area of high need schools and to conducting HR alignment assessment at the school level as well. These would represent two more special applications of conducting human resource management alignment. Now let's let's turn to um, your I, your assessment for readiness for HR assessment. If you're a district wanting to consider doing human resource alignment assessment the way I've described it, or using a similar process that you might derive yourself in your district, what sorts of things should you be thinking about? Well, first, are some stakeholders going to be supportive of, of this idea? Will the superintendent support it? Will the school board support it? Will the teachers association support it? Will they buy into the idea of having a system that is competency focused? Second question, 
we have a competency model. In the example I provided, the district already had a competency model and therefore was able to jump immediately into human resource alignment assessment. If you have a competency model, however, that becomes a starting point for your journey into ultimately being able to conduct human resource alignment. You will first need to develop that competency model and build your teacher evaluation system around it. Third question, are you willing to examine, really examine your human resource alignment to performance competencies and make changes? Are you really willing to dig in and look at what you're doing, see to what extent what you are doing is competency focused, and then are you going to be willing to identify and make the kinds of changes that might be indicated through the assessment process? Then finally, do you have the staff with the ability and motivation to do the assessment and then design and implement the changes? You might find, for example, that in fact you don't have uh, the current staff board to do those kinds of things, and therefore you will need to be thinking about the need for possibly um, helping these individuals acquire the knowledges and skills that they will need to do the HR, align, HR assessment process prior to actually engaging in the assessment process. So there's a lot to think about as you judge your readiness for human resource uh, alignment assessment. There's a couple of other points along these lines that I would like to make. Um, the first point is that uh, both myself and Tony have made many presentations on human resource alignment assessment um, in various districts uh, throughout the country. What we find is a lot of enthusiasm for, for human resource alignment assessment. But then we often find that there is a real to go down the human resource alignment assessment path. And so there's an inertia that has built up and we think that that inertia is probably due to how the district answers the following, or excuse me, the previous four questions that I asked. So I think it's very important to ask those questions as a way of judging your readiness for change. The second point I want to make, though, is that despite this inertia, what we're finding is that the logic and importance of human resource alignment assessment is really gaining strength, uh, particularly in the U.S. Department of Education. For example, in the, with regard to the Teacher Incentive Fund uh, program uh, sponsored by the Department of Education, the most recent round of Teacher Incentive Fund funding, the TIF-4 funding, um, required applicants to provide indications about their degree of human resource alignment, the degree to which they had a consistent and coherent human resource capital management system. And then those applications were judged in part on the following criterion, and this is a direct quote. Is a vision of instructional improvement, PREN, including teacher and principal competencies, PREN, clearly embedded in the human capital management system practices of recruitment, selection, induction, mentoring, professional development, teacher and principal evaluation, and compensation. Uh, the district was actually evaluated on the degree to which that vision of instructional improvement alignment was present in their application. Also, the, by way of uh, illustration, the Department of Education is beginning to conduct workshops on human resource, human resource alignment, as well as providing uh, technical assistance to districts. So looking ahead, we see uh, Tony and I and others that uh, some real traction is being generated in the area of human resource alignment, and um, we think that um, it is really um, a very sophisticated and potent way of approaching the issue of improving 
educator effectiveness. In conclusion, I hope that I piqued your interest in understanding about human resource alignment and human resource alignment assessment. I think it represents a very novel but a very straightforward way as a way of looking at human resource practices within a whole system as opposed to focusing simply on specific human resource practices as a standalone, including performance pay. Wherever human resource practices are administered and whoever conducts them, the concept of human resource alignment and human resource alignment assessment is applicable. And I think that slowly but surely, districts are going to become uh, accustomed to this concept of human resource alignment. They're going to embrace it. and They're going to begin adopting it more uh, systematically within their own districts. Thank you again. Thank you so much um, for an excellent, excellent presentation. We do have some time for questions. And for those of you who are listening, you can type questions into the question or the chat box. And we will begin with, uh, we have a couple of questions here. And the first one is about uh, getting buy-in for the readiness. So um, would you suggest that LEAs uh, follow this assessment process that you went through in your study? And if so, what recommendations would you have um, for buy-in or for the readiness to set it up? Well, I think the, the first part of the buy-in, and I, that's an excellent question, the first part of the buy-in is a real desire on the part of the district strategically to want to improve student learning. When the dis district makes that decision and says, we need to improve our what our kids learn, they're going to say, basically, we need to improve our instruction. And as soon as they say to improve our instruction, we're going to need to improve the individuals who deliver the instruction, and therefore we're going to need to deliver. We're going to need to improve the performances of those people and, and their performance competencies. Once that train of thought is developed, then I think the district is has gone a long way to saying we are ready for change, and we know that we need to do something differently to enhance the performance competencies of our educator workforce. Armed with that, then the question is, well, what do we do? And I think it's a very straightforward proposition to say, well, we need to look at what sorts of practices we're using right now and how well they actually help us acquire, develop, motivate, and retain those kinds of competencies. And therefore, we basically need to say, we need to do a, an assessment of our human capital management practices, where it might be within the district. Okay, thank you. And uh, one other question. And for those of you on, please know that this webinar is being recorded and archived. So you'll be able to listen and see it again. And another question is about having school leaders or principals involved in the process um, regarding what uh, you and your colleague did. How did you decide who to include in the working group? And is there a place for principals, or what would the place be for principals? When we uh, chose the work group, uh, the work group members, uh, we had fairly substantial discussions with um, with people within the district, including the the director of, of human resources, as well as some people on the instructional side, and um, we actually had on the work group a school principal. This is an excellent question, and I should have mentioned that uh, previously, and I did not. Um, so one of the three people that we considered from the instructional side was a principal. Yeah, uh, the other, another person was a master teacher from one of the schools, and the third person was, as I indicated, the director of mentoring in the school district. So we felt that we had the range of, of people um, represented who uh, delivered instruction in one way or another within the district. OK. 
Okay, thank you. And one last question, uh, and also participants, so you know, you can look in the chat box, and there are two links to additional resources. You can click on those uh, as well. So this last question is regarding the extensions, and this discussion was about the K-12 system and the district. What recommendations do you have for other contexts, like even a State Department of Education or a community college? Um, I would say in the case of a community college, I'm assuming that the issue is whether human resource alignment would be applicable to the instructional workforce in a community college. I think it definitely would be, but I think it might become a little more complicated by virtue of the fact that a community college may have a very diverse workforce in terms of the competencies that they have. And there, there might be a need for uh, thinking about multiple competency models um, and almost individual individualized capital management practices around each of those competency models. Um, that might make um, for a more complicated human resource alignment assessment, but again, I think it could be a very useful one in terms of suggesting ultimately the types of practices that might be done to improve um, human capital management uh, practices. And I'm sorry, I forgot what the other uh, part of the question was. It was with regard to community colleges and? Uh, State Departments of Education. State Departments of Education. Um, there I think that State Departments of Education could and should be thinking about ways that they might be a service provider to districts to help districts understand the concept of human resource alignment and human resource alignment assessment, as well as develop programs that the districts could adopt to uh, conduct in their own setting a human resource alignment assessment uh, process. I think this would represent a, a wonderful service that the uh, State Department of Education could provide to individual districts as a way of providing them competent individuals to con help them conduct the assessment, as well as uh, probably lessen the burden of conducting that process as well. Okay. Thank you. And we have one more question, and this is regarding Charlotte Danielson's model. Um, saying that uh, she's emphasized that her framework is designed as a tool to be coordinated with others to enhance professional development opportunities for teachers, that it's not meant to evaluate or deem a teacher competent or not for high stakes decisions related to pay or human resource decisions. Are there any teacher performance frameworks that have been shown effective and consistently applied to support systematic improvements like you're describing? This is, a, this is an excellent question, and it's, it's a sort of an ongoing uh, question for researchers. I should indicate in the case of uh, Charlotte Danielson's model, in fact, there has, has been some research uh, conducted on the model, and that research has looked at the degree to which there is a relationship between teacher evaluation ratings that teachers receive and the degree of student improvement in actual learning as assessed by various forms of standardized. In fact, Tony Milanowski, my colleague, has conducted some of that research. And the research, at least in the case of Charlotte's model, suggests that there are, in fact, significant linkages between how well teachers Store is, is part of the evaluation process and the subsequent learning of uh, their students. And we find that very encouraging for the idea of focusing on performance competencies within the Danielson framework. 
I think over time, researchers are going to be conducting this kind of research on other teacher competency models as well. And I'm willing to bet that we are going to find significant linkages between those competency models and student learning measures as well. Okay. Uh, thank you so much. And Dr. Henneman, I on behalf of the attendees today, as well as uh, REL Pacific, I would like to thank you for such an excellent and informative presentation. And uh, for those of you Oh, and, and for those of you who are still on, I would like you to turn your attention to the feedback survey. There is a link to that. So you'll see in your chat box, you'll see links to further information. And the last link will be your feedback for this webinar. And if you give us your feedback at that link, we can determine how to better serve you. So. Please click on that, and it should take just a few minutes if you're able to today. Thank you all for uh, joining us in this webinar, and thank you again, Dr. Henneman, for all of your wonderful information today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.